Hi, welcome. This project took way longer than I thought it would. My eldest son developed a fascination for battleships after we made the Bismarck and insisted on making another one. He got really interested in the Yamato. Together, we looked at models, extras, and all the information available online. This model is from Fuyumi, it is a snap together. And the results are quite good when complemented with Flyhawk's photo etch and extras. Which include brass cannons, resin anti-aircraft guns, and other parts. All the materials and pieces are listed in the description. Yamato is Japan's oldest poetic name. It shows up in historical texts for prehistoric legendary dates with names of gods and Japanese emperors. This mystic name was given to what was considered the strategic weapon of the Imperial Japanese Navy. The largest and more powerful battleship ever built. Unlike the Bismarck, it was operational for several years, but due to the secrecy surrounding it, all documentation, drawings, and photographs were destroyed before the surrender. The secret services were really good at this, and for many years there were only the aerial photos taken by US aeroplanes. When looking for more information, I was recommended the book Anatomy of the Ship, the Battleship Yamato by Janu Skulski. It helped to get a few things right, as the Yamato was deployed multiple times and went through a few modifications. The Japanese Navy wanted to counterbalance the number of American battleships in the Pacific with fewer, larger ships. But by the time the Yamato went into service naval warfare had changed with the introduction of aeroplanes, making battleships obsolete. Just think that a lucky bomb could cripple a large ship easily. In the end, the Yamato was sunk by an aerial attack during Operation Tengo. Before this, on 25 October, 1944, it participated in the Battle of Samar. In this battle the Japanese fleet surprised the northernmost unit of Task Force 77.4, the Taffy 3. At the beginning of this battle, the Yamato hit the escort carrier White Plains from about 20 miles away, or about 32 kilometers away. That shows how powerful its guns were. The Allied forces fought hard with the wrong weapons. For example, the bombers attacked the Japanese ships using anti-submarine bombs that would bounce off the ships. Still, the destroyers and aeroplanes went all out and helped the carriers get away. If you want to know more about this battle, there are links in the description. I made a few adjustments to build this model. I replaced my old tweezers with new ones to be able to handle the photo etch. I learned other painting techniques. I switched to 60 second glue. That really made it easier to put the photo etch in place, as the glue is also sticky. And it gave me time to remove or adjust anything. And I got helpers. She helped me a bit, but not in the ways you would think. I also got help from my son and niece. The details are amazing, and there are lots of them. There are plenty of photo etch details or guns to cut, fold, and place. To cut the etching I use the cardboard the etching comes with on top of a tile. This etch has a mark on the place to cut. If you pay attention, when you slide the knife on the sheet, you can feel where it is. Also, you can hear it. On the note of the instructions. It has some missing guidelines. For example, it doesn't show where all the doors or hatches go. So I placed based on the model and the book. It is up to you to figure out what you need to cut and replace. If you don't pay attention it will be too late to do it. Some pieces are not in the guide at all. While some pieces come in the right numbers, others do not. Others have spares, and some pieces I guess were for another model. Even though the model is quite accurate, I remade the tripod's main mast. For this, I used 0.5mm brass rods. The rods are thinner than the plastic, and at this scale, they look quite sleek. The Flyhawk extras come with a replacement for the 40 caliber anti-aircraft guns. It also comes with replacement barrels for the anti-craft guns turrets. After thinking about it, 
I decided to replace the barrels of the shielded anti-aircraft guns with 0.2mm brass rods. There were three barrels per gun, and this gave me the chance to make them point upward. Like firing at enemy aeroplanes. Together with the 28 etched open mounted anti-aircraft guns created a lot of work. I am grateful that I had help. But after putting most of the etching details in and finishing the anti-air guns, I took a break. There were several reasons. I felt it became a sort of chore and stopped being fun. Soon, I realized that if I stopped for too long, I would never finish the model. Also, I had the idea of the planes dropping the bombs. So I decided to go back and start by testing if power passes through the brass guns. It does. This meant I could send the power to the LEDs through the guns, and it would seem invisible. I glued together a set of three LEDs per gun. Two oranges and one white are working in series. The two sets are working in parallel with one energy source. Because I always use a 9 volt battery, each set has its own resistor. Soldiering was quite easy, but later I would find out that this type of material is not very strong if it moves constantly. One of the guns would get loose just when I couldn't fix it. I had to pass a naked cable under one of the cannons to make it work. With the gun's lights ready, I decided to start the process of painting. First, I painted the deck so it could be put together with the hull as a single piece. Also because it is the only one using a color other than a shade of gray. After the primer, I used deck brown for this. Once they were dry, I put the main hull and deck together and filled any gaps between them. At this point, I realized that adding the cranes on the sides would have been much easier if I had put the deck first. Another life lesson. Before painting the main hull with the primer and the IJN Cure Grey, I covered the deck with liquid latex. I did a small trial beforehand to make sure that it is easy to remove and wouldn't damage what had been painted. It worked. Applying and removing the latex was much easier than using tape, it was not faster because the latex must dry and it must be left in an area with circulating air. Besides these details, it worked much better than tape allowing me to reach tricky places without too much trouble. I also painted all the pieces that were ready. This helped to do everything in one go and speed up the construction. Once all the paint had dried, I removed the latex and used a very diluted wash of dark brown on the deck to highlight some areas and highlight the panels on the deck. I used the dry pencil technique with white on the ship to highlight the details. This is oil paint, which takes a few days to dry and can be removed in some cases. I found it to work differently than using dark washes to darken clear colors on the ships, and I feel it looks better. It is important to note that the Yamato received a fresh coat of paint each time it stopped at a shipyard. This implies that the ship's gray was different depending on which shipyard visited it last. In this case, the Yamato visited the Cure shipyard until April 1944 so it wouldn't look old and rusty. It would look a bit rusty and quite dirty, as records show that it was painted with soot the night before the battle so it could navigate unseen at night. If you want to know more, please visit the Combined Fleet site, the link is in the description. I used the same technique of dry brushing white on all metal parts of the battleship. It really brought the ship to life. Also made the model look less dark and highlighted shapes, while corners would remain dark. Oil paint takes a long time to dry, so after painting all parts and applying the dry brush, I left them on a dry place and started on the base and ocean. I had prepared a transparent acrylic the right size, on which I painted the shadow of the ship on the opposite side from where the waves would be. It turns out that the ocean is not just blue everywhere. 
As the ships speed up, a combination of white and turquoise forms at the back, and if there is a swift turn, there are changes in waves and colors depending on speed. All these colors are magnified in pictures and videos as they use polarized filters. Not to mention that the vibrations of a battleship firing its cannons make a lot of small waves around the hull. To represent this chaos, I used a sponge to apply water-based acrylics in layers. Starting with a darker blue in calm places and adding combinations or lighter blues. While on the active parts where the battleship is turning or moving through, it started with clear colors and used darker combinations of blue, white, and green. Finally, at the back of the ship, it was mostly a combination of white and green with a little blue. If anything didn't feel right, I would clean it and start over. The final result looks chaotic, but if you pay attention, you can spot different areas and recognize what should be going on there. Finally, I covered everything with a layer of Tomia Ocean Blue. Once dried, I glued the acrylic to a foam base using white glue. Sadly, I ran out of MDF. Once everything dried, I carved the guides for the wires that will bring power to the LEDs. For the waves, I used super heavy gel. This time, I used a stick to apply it. This is not the Baltic Sea, and the ocean was flat and calm that day. It took a couple of days to dry properly. Then I used white to highlight the waves, using the same dry brush technique as for the ship, but this time with the brush a bit more loaded, so more paint would remain on the tip of the waves. Also, I started with very light turquoise, making the waves closer to the ship, then used white across the board. The difference before and after is noticeable. I added two small but tall water explosions. They make the diorama more visually exciting and are not difficult to make but take some time to do. So it is better to do them in advance. To make the main structure, I use transparent sprues remaining from other models. Also bits and pieces from a broken transparent pen. I made a higher one for a new explosion and a short one for an old one with the water coming down. To make the water, I used the one and only super heavy gel. I created a strip more or less 2 cm wide on the plastic bottles of the primers. These have undulating edges. I added little or no cotton, so I could see how the strips would behave. I was surprised as it made almost no difference with the ones I added cotton. Once dried, I peeled the strip and cut it in half along the long middle. Then in smaller parts. I glued them in layers from top to bottom. Attaching the sharp end to the sprues and using the gel as adhesive. Sometimes I cut the uneven parts to make them more chaotic. But I didn't do it very often. I added hollow fiber to the shorter one to simulate the mist of the water falling down. This polyester product is used for filling pillows and toys. Not perfect but good enough. These pieces took for days to complete until fully dry. As I said, each step involving gel requires time as it must dry properly. So, I left them in a dry corner until it was time to put them in place. The bridge is in pieces all over the place, it is time to put it together and complete it. This is a snap it together kit, and these parts require force to fit in the right place. I ended up cutting the guides as the extra force needed, combined with my orangutan hands, started damaging the photo etch. With extra glue, the pieces stayed in place without any problems if they were not moved until the glue set. There were a few bits and pieces that were added at this stage as they would be on the way otherwise, things like binoculars at the top of the bridge, ladders, and handrails. I used panel black to darken corners and metal floors, and a little white dry brushing to highlight corners and the floor structure. I also took the chance to use a black wash and white brush on the anti-aircraft turrets and guns, so all would be dry at the same time to put on the ship. It was then a matter of gluing everything in place. Before gluing the hull to the base, I made the holes for the lead wires. I want to point out that I was too conservative, and it would have been better to make them bigger, maybe with a crown drill instead of a handmade hole. 
This was not noticeable until later, when the wires had to go through. With the right glue, the ship sticks in place in minutes. Then the next step is to add the ocean waves around the ship. I didn't use cotton mixed with the gel, instead, I made sure the waves followed a pattern like being pushed away from the hull. Also, there were many of them. When it dried, I used a more loaded white dry brush to highlight the top and some of the base of the waves. When I made the gel strips for the water explosions, I saved a few of them to make the waves in front of the Yamato. The same pieces work really well when cut into triangles of different sizes and put in layers. The anti-aircraft guns are pointing upwards because the aeroplanes had bombs, not torpedoes, so they were diving towards the ship. With the bridge in place, I glued the aft guns and the Nendo Shiki gun. I had to file the guide of the main gun so it would fit without force. Also, directly remove the guide of the Nendo Shiki gun. Excessive force will damage the etching. I used a black wash for the cannon's covers and dry white to highlight the handrails. The front guns were a bit more complicated. I passed the wires through the ship, and they came out at the bottom of the base, to end on one side. This is when I realized the holes were a bit tight. A bigger hole would have made things easier. Once the glue on the guns had set properly, I started soldering them together and setting the battery connection. I tested it all a few times as this type of soldering is not as strong as welding, and excessive moving will snap it. I have used photo etched crew from Edward or Flyhawk in the past. This time I found 3D printed crew online. I wanted to give it a try. The first thing was to apply primer, and then paint them green based on the colors shown in this still from the Yamato movie for the anti-aircraft operators. The results are better than the photo etch, as these have more volume, even at this size, they look better. I have to say that they are quite fragile, and some would lose a limb when I cut them to put them in place. I realized too late that I should have done a lighter green wash before cutting, as once in place, a dry brush would just break them to pieces. I added some 50 anti-aircraft operators this way. I think I was short, and I should have put some 150. This model of the Yamato has 28 triple unshielded anti-aircraft guns around the ship, and manning them with just two people doesn't feel right. Also, the total crew was around 3,250 people, so 150 is not a far-fetched estimation. I think I will add more in the future if the price is right. The use of sandbags to protect the anti-aircraft crew was a quick and easy trick to implement. The Allies would pin them down with strafing and rockets from the fighters before the bombers attacked. This would quickly decimate anti-aircraft gunners. Finally, it is time for the rigging. The rigging of the Yamato should be the same as that of the Musashi, her sister ship. And as with the Musashi, there are no clear diagrams to follow. I used super fine string by QW model. The Flyhawk kit includes the string for the model. But I put it in a very safe place, and I cannot find it. As you can see, it is really thin. It can stretch without problems, but if you stretch and release it, it curls, so I stretch the minimum possible. Also, if one string touches another, they stick together, entangling themselves. This requires close attention. If you make a mistake, just keep calm and carry on. To glue the rigging in place, I decided to switch from the white glue to the 60 second glue, which is sticky and I feel performs better. To be able to see the strings, I placed a piece of white paper behind the model, otherwise, it would have been borderline impossible to see the strings. The glue takes a minute to set, so when I glue the first extreme, I proceed to put another string in a different place. The first time I came up with this idea, I glued the first extreme of six different strings. I found it to be too much to handle. Some strings were too close and ended up entangled between them. Finally, I settled on working on three strings at the same time. So, 
I cut the three strings to put on the model and started gluing them on one end where it would be difficult or impossible to cut the excess. I try to use a little quantity of glue, more glue won't make a difference and will take longer to set. By the time I place the third, the first would have set. Then I glue the other end and cut the excess. Then go for the next. Rigging produces a lot of waste. Cutting it too short made me stretch the string too much, so it is better to cut longer strings. If it was too long, I tried using the excess in a different place. This worked a couple of times. The strings are almost invisible at a distance. But as you get closer to the model, they become visible. It is easier to spot them if there is a white background. I am happy with how the model looks with them. Once I finished the rigging, I started adding dark grey cotton to simulate the smoke coming out of the chimney. I dyed this cotton, and it turned out just right. Putting the first group of fibers between the rigging was tricky because they didn't want to stay in place. They wanted to come back with the tweezer. Finally, I managed to create a small column without damaging the rigging around it. As I was with the cotton, I added the anti-aircraft smoke. I didn't realize how many of them were shooting, I kept on finding more that needed the smoke. The smoke is meant to be a light grey, but I chose to go with the normal white instead. It gives more contrast against the ship's grey. With all the guns in place, I used the transparent sprues and bits left over to make a skeleton that would hold the fireball cotton. This was glued with a heat gun and transparent glue. It was easier, the glue is sticky, and it sets and cools very fast. I changed the material slightly for the fireball. Instead of a semi-transparent mesh, I used a bit of yellow cellophane sheet. I found this material by chance. It helped to create volume. Also adds extra color to the lead light. I was surprised at how well it worked. For the fireball itself, I used orange dyed cotton with different levels of saturation. From the almost white to the full on orange. I used little to no glue to keep the cotton in place. I used the clear ones on top and the more fiery orange ones closer to the guns. Lastly, I added a few fibers of black cotton here and there for the black smoke. Later, I decided to add more black fibers. I tested the LEDs a few times out of sheer paranoia that the lights wouldn't work anymore. Taffy 3 air carriers were attacked by surprise and scrambled their Wildcat fighters and Avengers torpedo bombers against the Japanese Navy. These aeroplanes took off with the weapons they had prepared to attack the Japanese army. I decided to use a brush instead of the airbrush to paint them. My decision was influenced by the fact that by then I had cleaned, boxed, and stored all the airbrush kit. The aeroplanes didn't need much in terms of modifications. The Avenger is meant to have a line from the cockpit to the tail, but it is invisible in every picture I saw, so I didn't put it. The first layer of paint was grey primer. Once dried, for the bottom I used naval grey and for the top I used dark blue. Once dried, I lightened the colors with a dry brush. White at the bottom and a combination of blue, dark blue, and white for the top. To be honest, I thought it was going to be harder. It was slow as the paints had to dry properly. Finally, I added the decals. These fit really well on the wings, but are tricky on the sides. They do not bend to the shape of the tail, and the numbers are all separated and have to be added individually. 0.75 fiber optics hold the planes in the air. I drilled a small hole in the bottom and glued it there. Also glued two shorter pieces of 0.25mm fiber optics with a small piece of putty left over from the sandbags, painted dark grey. They simulate bombs being dropped. The last thing to add is the propellant. 
For this, I used a hole puncher to cut three pieces from a piece of hard plastic from a toy box. Then I sanded it a little so it wouldn't be fully transparent. You will notice that one of the planes was hit. I saw this picture and thought I had to include something like that. Also, it is not dropping any bombs. During the battle, some aeroplanes would do dry runs to make a ship turn and not be able to target properly with its cannons. There were many anti-aircraft explosions around the ship as the air attacks were not coordinated. I glued a few black cotton fibers to a 0.25mm fiber optic. She had an opinion on some of them and had to use darker cotton. This fiber optic is too thin for a hole, so I had to glue it to the base directly. The last thing is the display case. It is made of 2mm transparent acrylic, cut to size. It is meant to protect the diorama from dust, accidental cleaning, children, and cats. This model with the extras is a real challenge, not so much of skill as of will. It takes a lot of work and dedication, and it is so easy to say enough is enough and give up. If you stayed until here, thanks for watching.